Hello and welcome to Digital Photography's i3 lecture series. Tonight we are joined by a retoucher extraordinaire, Carrie Bean. Um, thank you. <laughs> Carrie is the owner and principal retoucher of Carrie New York City, a studio with work published in dozens of fashion beauty magazines. Her clients include MAC, Revlon, Maybelline, Elizabeth Arden, L'Oreal, Chantecaille, and Biomega. Her work has been published in Shape Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, New York Times, Sports Illustrated, Cosmo, Marie Claire, Elle, Glamour, Vogue, W, you name it, Vanity Fair, among many others. She is also the author of Real Retouching, a professional step-by-step -step guide. And she brought a copy along tonight. More details on that later. But there will be a special giveaway to one lucky student or audience member. Um, we are so proud to have Carrie here as a uh, faculty at MPSDP. Um, and we know her as a caring and talented educator. So please help me welcome her to our lecture series. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. This is going to be a little bit different tonight because what I usually do is I talk to some of you students I recognize uh, about how to do it. That's usually what I'm talking about is doing demos and how do I uh, set up my brushes. Katrine tells me how unsexy that is. But very, very, very important. Um, but tonight I'm going to, oh, I'm going to show you some stuff too. Believe me, I'm going to show you some stuff. But I'm not really going to be um, telling you the how-tos exactly. You're going to see some things along the way. But um, tonight I'm really kind of talking about retouching uh, the industry and, you know, how did I get here and how can you get here if that's what you're interested in doing. I have a lot of people who ask me that on a regular basis, what to do, what's, how to get a portfolio together, um, you know, what steps to take once they've, you know, gotten out of school and, uh, you know, want to move on and up into the industry more. Um, so I'm going to talk about those sort of things. And then we will dissect some, some files, too. Uh, I brought with me, like, really heinous files that have 500 layers in them and that kind of stuff, which um, is meant to scare you. It's meant to scare you because uh, one thing I do want to talk about is being prepared when you go out into the workforce and you want to become a retoucher or, you know, really any job for that matter. Uh, before you start putting yourself out there as, you know, professional and looking for like the top-notch clients, be sure that you know what you need to know to be able to knock it out of the park and be able to handle that responsibility because once you lose a client, believe me, you're not getting them back. And that's something important to, I mean, rarely, rarely going to get a chance to get them back. So I thought I would start by talking a little bit about how I got here. Um, it, it was a kind of an odd story because I studied painting. And I went to the Kansas City Art Institute, and I have a degree in painting. My poor dad, right? Uh, however, the art degree did end up helping me in the end. I mean, I painted for many years. And uh, I was at a turning point in my life, and I needed to do something else. And my mother said, uh, Carrie, why don't you do something with your art? You know, like mothers will, will do. And I was like, well, yeah, but, you know, I don't see that many jobs for a famous painter out there. So, uh, you know, I started looking at it, thinking I had a photographer friend and then another friend who uh, showed me Photoshop. And the first time I ever saw Photoshop, something went ballistic in my head. And I would have never in a million years thought that I would do artwork on a computer because I was entirely against it. But when I saw the Photoshop thing, I just, I don't know, something happened to me. And I was like, okay, I got to know about this. So I spent every waking moment finding out everything I could possibly learn about Photoshop. And I started, when I started, it was... Um, Photoshop, <laughs> don't laugh, Photoshop, I started on Photoshop 3, but it wasn't the most up-to-date. I, I started working on Photoshop 3, not CS3, kids. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I realized 
okay, this is not the most up-to-date software, so I need to have, this is important, I need to have the most up-to-date software. So I went out and bought a copy of CS, uh, I'm sorry, Photoshop 5. Okay, that's what I started on. So I, I got up every day and I spent eight hours minimum teaching myself Photoshop and going online and finding out, you know, who was teaching what and what books were out there and got everything and um, signed up for a class at a community college. By the time I got to the class at the community college, I knew more than the teacher did. So, uh, you know, I, I put my everything into it and spent all my time learning to, so that Photoshop would be just a right-handed, you know, extension of my hand. Because when you're retouching, it's artistic and you really need to not be thinking about all the technicality of what Photoshop does for you. Is like you want to be able to like grab your brushes and do your thing. You're, you know, you're painting. You're working. This is this is art related field. Somebody asked me that the other day. Do you have to be creative to be a retoucher? Um, yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, so I finally was able to snag. The first job that I was able to snag was at a a, 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 a photo lab, and I worked there hard for two years and slave heart. I'm telling you, this was a place where you had to sign up for all that you could not say no to overtime. We worked 12 hours a day and eight on Saturday. And I worked, I think that's the hard, this is probably the hardest I ever worked in my life. And I never called in sick. I never did anything. I asked questions of everybody and I watched everything that happened there. I taught myself about printing. How, what, I didn't want to just become a, a retoucher only because I need to know what about the color process behind this? You know, um, what are the color profiles? What, uh, how is the printing process? Print for what? We're like one thing, you're going to print for a little tiny, you know, you're going to do one thing for a little tiny print. What other kinds of printers are there? Uh, all of those things were important to the job that I wanted to do. So I spent a lot of time doing that. I went home at night and I worked hard to teach myself even more. I bought Katrina Isom's book way back in the day and I still use techniques that I learned in that book today. I uh, sometimes add weird things to what she was doing, but that's where I got my ground uh, work. One of the best books that I bought, the beginning book was uh, Katrina, what was the? Um, Photoshop Restoration and Retouching. Photoshop Restoration and Retouching. Uh, first edition, I think. <laughs> so I think there's like three now. Um, Great book, just all the little uh, things that you you know you need to learn about how to use Photoshop and just add that to your repertoire. So you know also uh, things that Photoshop CS5, I mean Photoshop 5 did back then are still things that we you, we do in CC 2014 today. Okay, like high pass filter, right? Can't live without it myself. Um, so. Eventually, I, get, I started sending it for you who are trying to get in. Uh, I eventually I sent my uh, resume out to New York City high-end studios. Somebody advertised. I think back at that time it was Monster.com. That people don't even use that anymore. Uh, and I got a bite. So I waited until I had a 12-minute break at the job that I was working at, ran out to the payphone, nobody had cell phones even back, that was not even that long ago, uh, and, and called uh, the studio and managed to get them to send me a test. Send me a test because I was outside of Kansas City. I mean, uh, I was in Kansas City, which is where my parents lived, and that's why I had to, anyway, that's a long story why I was there. but. Uh, I wanted to work in New York City, come back to New York City where I had lived before, and I got this studio to, to send me a test. When I opened up the test, it was like so big, it was like, I thought it was amazing because it was 100 megabytes. I was like, oh my God, my machine would barely like even open it and everything. And, and when I looked at it, it was Cameron Diaz. I, and I was impressed. I was big time impressed. I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is the, where I want to work, right? Now looking back at it, I'm just amazed that what kind of a crazy fool would send Cameron Diaz before picture to some fool in Kansas City they don't even know. I would not do that. If you're going to get a test for me in my studio, it's not going to be a celebrity, okay? 
Uh, but anyway, I was quite thrilled. And the and I know why he sent the test because it was really difficult. She's a very sporty girl. The, the skin was very rough and red because she has like rosacea or something like that. And she's a you know snowboarder and all this. She had like snow cheeks and everything. And I did it and I got the job. Okay. So then I worked for two years in that studio, learning everything I could possibly learn until I got to the point where I knew I needed to move on and I freelanced for another two or three years, moving from great studio to great studio and watching what other people did, learning from them, they learned from me until finally I got to the point where I said, okay, I can start getting my own clients, okay? So I worked for some photographers for free. I know I, uh, by that time I'd been working in the industry a little while. I worked for one of the best clients I ever had was a young guy who was a makeup artist and he hired me early on to do some retouching for his portfolio at a cheap rate, whatever. And he introduced me to a couple of photographers that he worked with who I still work with today. Okay. So don't look down at, you know, like, it's like anybody in the industry, this one makeup guy, you know, one little makeup artist who was a friend of a friend in the industry. And that led to like a lot of jobs that I still work on today. All right. So um, that's just a little bit of background on me. And now I have uh, a studio of my own. It's Carrie NYC. It's a small studio. I have only like three stations, but we do a lot of work. It's humble, but you'd be amazed at the work that goes on. I have worked on literally hundreds of campaigns and images, high-end stuff, and I have a lot of retouchers that work for me off-site as well. So when we get busy, I can have as many as 10 retouchers working for me, right? So and that's another thing I like to point out to people who they the, they want to be a retoucher, they think they're good enough to be professional, and they, they go to ad agencies, and they're, they're talking to the ad agency, oh, why, I saw one on the internet the other day, oh, well, I can't get the ad agencies to give me any work. I was like, are you ready for that? I mean, what if they say, okay, here's 15 Pantene images we need to see first round on that, on that uh, next week. You have no idea how much work goes into a Pantene image. I'll show you. Uh, the kind of, this is not actually a Pantene image because you can't show the befores of those. Here's an image that, uh, okay, let me just zoom that in just a little bit and bear with me because retouchers are not used to working on laptops. Laptops are like little bugs that need to be stepped on. We don't know what it is and the buttons are in the wrong place and everything is wrong about it. We like big monitors and we like big Macs and we like our big Wacom tablets. Obviously everybody knows here that you have to use a Wacom tablet when you're retouching. I forgot mine today so they lent me one here, thank God. So just to show the complete, no, sorry for the struggle. <laughs> okay, before and after. Uh, so that took a lot of time. It took a, lot, a really amazing amount of time because one, one of the things about doing a hair job like this is you, uh, you don't just go in and use some sort of filter and then smooth over the hair in some sort of strange way. You know, it's like you can't, uh, you know, you can't fake it. You have to zoom in super close and very carefully uh, remove all the little hairs, prep up the image, and get it all ready. So, um, and by the way, there's really not a lot of retouching on this girl's face. I mean, I straightened up her smile and stuff like that. She was doing a little smirk thing, and uh, I straightened her up. <laughs> Right. So, uh, I don't know. Ooh, gosh. Yeah, I don't think you're going to be able to see. 
you're not going to be able to see, see super details. This is a little bit low res, but if we were on like a, a, re a regular screen, you'd be able to, to see a little bit more as far as just like removing each individual hair. So you'll have to take my word for it that you take a clone stamp tool, you go in with like, I usually use 80, 90% rather than 100. For some reason, it works a little better for me. And just very meticulously remove the stray hairs until you, until you have like a, a nice palette. And then, of course, you begin to do your dodge and burn. So in the years of retouching, uh, doing this job or doing that job, um, I, I get a lot of questions. I what was like one of the strangest things that you, they ever asked you to do? Like many, many, many things over the years. And those things accumulate into the skills that you eventually have. Because the, the first time somebody asked you to, for example, change um, fingernail color, that doesn't sound like a big deal. But actually, changing fingernail color can kind of be uh, difficult because they, you know, it has to look all very natural and so on and so on. This, this may, as far as natural is concerned, this may not be my best example. But if you look at the before, that's where we started. The nails were actually shot for like a completely different makeup, and they just didn't have time to change it when they did this shop. They did several looks in one night, and so uh, they just left the, the fingernails on and said, oh, they'll do it in post. <laughs> they'll do it in post. So uh, I had to figure out a way to get rid of all those crazy colors. It's not like it was just one color and I had to change it to another. It was 47 colors and I had to change it to a single color. So it just made it even more annoying and. Uh, and it had to be neon colors on top of it. Um, I, th I think it's kind of fun to see, there they are. I did label, so, so this is a, the folder that I put the nails in, right? So the fingernails are all in this folder and they are, um, that's the mask that's on the folder, right? So it's masking out everything else except for the fingernails. So any color correction that I put inside of that folder, it's actually called a group, right? It used to be called folder, now it's called a group. Anything that's inside that folder or group is masked out. So I can do all of my color corrections without having to like remask and so on. Um, but if I turn this back on, just turn everybody back off and you'll see just step by step what I did to do it. Instead of like trying to do just one single thing, I like, I, I took a hair color. I just, I just selected some of the color of the hair and I put it in a solid col color adjustment layer and I set the adjustment layer to a multiply blending mode. Blending modes are something that help us like, exponentially do our job because without them, uh, like, some, things, some color corrections would just be impossible. So that started to tone it down just a little bit. See how it toned down the color. It's not as dark. It's not quite as offensive. Uh, so then I, did, I, I selected another little bit blonder piece and I replicated it and did the same thing again. So that got it down a little bit darker still. And I knew I wanted to go red, so I chose a red color and set it to multiply. Okay, if, if I don't set it to multiply, it's not going to be able to darken down. Multiply is a darkening blending mode. It's not going to be able to darken down those fingernails. And then, not quite yet, I said I put another one so that now I've almost filled in that middle, but I still kind of have a little bit of a round shape. And then pulled a little bit of curve to like add in a little lightness to the middle and then painted the rest. So yeah, you do have to be creative to be able to be a retoucher because I just painted the highlights. I painted the, um, you know, it looks a little pixelated, I'm sorry, on this screen. It looks a little better here, but I think you can tell, right? Uh, could you, maybe if I zoom out where it's going. So then you can see from that, 
to that. Okay, so it's a lot of different building up of different things and, and like just knowing a lot of different, um, you know, things that you add together. It's like I couldn't have just pulled a curve or tried to darken that or maybe try to colorize it somehow. I, I had to come up with a strategy to, uh, you know, give it some sort of realistic look. And so throughout the years, those are the little things that you, you know, repeat, you, you, you pick up and learn and, and, you know, have in your arsenal. Okay, and that's a, and, and you see there's quite a lot of layers in this particular file. It's pretty typical of my stuff. There's a, a actually not as many as in, in many uh, of, of, the, of uh, my work, but there's quite a few layers and you've got to kind of keep a general um, organization to it, which is another part of retouching, is just keeping all your, fi your, your uh, layers organized. Because if you're going to go work in a studio or retouching studio, if you hand off your file to the next guy and your stuff is all over the place, um, you know, that next guy is going to be pretty irritated with you and, you know, probably not going to keep your job too long because you, you need to follow some sort of protocol. You can't have uh, things thrown all over the place. And that's just something that you do need to learn. Uh, just to show you a couple things that we do, just, you know, examples of um, things that we get asked to do. I do uh, product work. This is just, a, this has been simplified, so you just see straight up, this is the before shot. Okay, so I, w that's what it looked like when I got it. So I looked at that, okay, now I need to uh, clean up distractions, clean up the powder inside of the product, make it look nice and clean and smooth. And in these particular kinds of product shots, we remove all of the type completely. We remove the type, go to Illustrator, take the type uh, from Illustrator so that it's vector, bring it over as a smart object, and then warp it onto our uh, product. That way it's super sharp. So uh, in this particular case, it wasn't too difficult, but sometimes it can get complicated, and I'll show you an example in just a moment where removing the type was uh, easier said than done. So the first step on this job was to color correct, clean and color correct. Right? You see how all the type straightened up and how the brush got, and, and particularly take a look at the upper right-hand side brush. So the actual shot itself was dark and had no detail. I did not have another shot of it. That's the only shot I had. So I had to use Photoshop to figure out how to pull detail out of that brush that I had. And that's how much detail I was able to get, just using Photoshop tools. Okay. So uh, then they wanted a second version with different color powder, and a different um, canister. So I used the same shot and I color corrected the silver to gunmetal, what they call their gunmetal product. Okay, you notice it keeps all the actual um, reflections and shadows of the original, but yet, you know, I can't just paint it black. So I have to figure out a way to retain all of that information but yet change the color from white, you know, to, to change something white to another color and keep retaining information behind it is complicated in Photoshop, unless you know the tricks. Okay? And while we're talking about things that they ask you to do, a lot of times we're asked to uh, create products that haven't actually been made yet. Yes, that happens. So they shoot something that kind of sort of looks like it and then tell you what it's supposed to look like, <laughs> right? And so you're talking with the art director and say, well, it's smoother than that. And, and that's a whole other thing in retouching as well is uh, uh, 
the language that we use to express things to each other. There's a whole language. This guy right here is Timothy Sixton. Wait, wave, Tim. Who, who is a super high-end, extremely talented retoucher. And he knows exactly what I'm talking about on this. Uh, it, it's the language that we use to talk to each other. It's like, uh, it, 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 it comes to a point where you know, there's like certain words that are that just click for us that we use over and over again to be between art directors and between retouchers. It's a hard thing. You, if you can't show somebody what you want and you're trying to describe verbally what you want, it can, you know, give a wide gamut of confusion there. But this particular um, image, they had not, they had an old tube and the tube looked like that. And I made it look like that. So the, the old tube was all textured up and, and had the wrong, uh, the wrong um, font on it. The, the text was all wrong and everything else. So then also, I don't know if you can see this. I was particularly proud of uh, this top part. I don't know if the, you can see it that well, but so, you know, the, the crimping that you had. So I had to like just hand create the crimping myself. So. This is an old file. I don't know. You know, I could probably knock that out. But sometimes the time that it takes is actually more for them to get you to understand what they're looking for rather than, you know, it's like if, they, if you could just read their mind, which sometimes I think that they believe that you can. <laughs> she asked me, did I basically wipe out everything that was there? Um, I, there was a lot of painting on it. I smooth a lot of painting, a lot of painting, actually. Um, and l like for the... For example, the, the highlight on the side, it's totally created, completely and totally created. I, um, I, I lassoed an area and on an empty layer I painted with white and I used the gradient tool to gradient and then I, yeah, yeah I, I, I used a transform tool to pull it back down and get it in, then I erased part, you know, I probably put a mask on it and then brushed away parts of it until I got it exactly to the shape that I wanted. So it's complicated, and the, the little dots that you see, those dots were actually from a different product that went along with this product, and they shot the actual product. The actual product was like a little tin can, and they shot that for me. So I took the dots off of the tin can and then applied them to this. Yeah, I, what I did was I used the, when I, it was shot on a black tin, right? So it was just like that, it was black tin with the little sprinkles. And so I took that part out and then I put it on a layer and I set it to lighten. So if I had this on a layer, you could see I can just move those little dots around however I want to because they're, on bl they're light dots shot on black. So if I set the blending mode to lighten, only the light stuff is gonna show against that black. So then I just move it around until I got it. And then I duplicate it and move it around, erase a couple so it doesn't look, pardon me, doesn't look repeated. Cause that's another thing in Photoshop you don't wanna when you're doing stuff like that, you don't want repeats. That's something we do all day long is like move things around so your eye doesn't catch any little repeats where, you know, don't want to, we don't want you guys to catch us retouching. I, I just painted it. I just painted. I, I made a, a white, one white, and then I moved it over, merged that together, duplicate, now I have four, merge those together, and then I move those over, Merge it together, and I have eight. It's painted. It's just painted. Carefully. Uh, oh, so let's talk a second about color. Just to show you a little something. So I had an original with dolphins on it, and they wanted uh, the same box, but with, uh, what were they, turtles? <laughs> That was the test question. No. Okay. So this is, you see the layers over there. You're thinking, oh, that's nothing. You know, just cut out some layers from, you know, the other shot and then cut it round and stuck it in there. Oh, no. <laughs> if only. So when you see when I open this up, let's just look at, let's just look at the, the bottom right turtle. 
for example. You see, they all are in their little groups. Now I'm going to open up the bottom right green turtle. Zippity doo dah. <laughs> all those layers to create the green turtle. And the original, that's what he looked like when I took him out of his uh, f uh, photograph that, you know, of the turtles. Dragged it over into my file, put it into a folder, masked it out, and then added all the color corrections to make it look like the product. Because I have the product right there in front of me in my light box, and I'm looking at the product and looking at my image, and I have to match it to. And the, the crazy thing about this particular client and these particular products is that they have an overspray. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm going to have a fight with this thing. In a minute. I was like, it's like, if I hear them say, can you make the overspray show a little bit more? <laughs> One more time, you know, because it's pearlescent. And that stuff never shows in, in photography. You know, you have to use Photoshop to make it look pearlescent. Like some, you know, mother of pearl watches I did one time that just about did me in. Okay, just to show you, it, it, it is far from simple. You look at a, you know, you look at uh, maybe a Duratrans, like, you know, you're in the airport and you see a big cosmetic um, ad on the wall with the light coming behind it. That's a Duratrans, you know. The work that has gone into that to make it look perfect, beautiful, color corrected. And it... It's not like you're faking something because I'm using a photograph and and the product, and I'm making the 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 photograph look like the product, you know, not the other way around. I'm not trying to fake anything. I'm trying to make it look real, actually. Okay, and so along those lines, you know, it's because we've the elephant in the room is the whole thing about uh, uh, retouchers making girls look more beautiful than they can possibly be and we make them skinny and and so on and so on well i mean I, I really i'm not on the side of that obviously um for a lot of reasons and i'm not going to like go into a whole big spiel about the reasons why i don't believe that it was like, i don't get my self-worth from pictures in magazines personally never did even when i was a young girl like it's not the way that i would look at things and i think that maybe i have other issues if that is the case. But, um, you know, a lot of the time, <laughs> I just call, got called delusional in some sort of blog recently because I said that uh, sometimes we make the girls bigger. Because a lot of times we do make the girls bigger because they're very skinny, these models. I mean, you know, that's not Photoshop's fault and that's not me as a retoucher's fault. That's the standard and has been for a long time. And, you know, that's neither here nor there. I don't judge that. But, um, for example, we don't, we don't always, the girls are models for a reason. Here's the, here's the image I did. I did color correction and, and I did skin retouching on her chest. And that, that is all. I did color correction. You see, I did not move her body at, at all. That's the way her body was. I, I fixed her bathing suit okay I, I fixed the bathing suit I gave the bathing suit a bad self-image because it was a saggy wrinkled bathing suit <laughs> okay see I, I moved the bathing suit so that it was fitting on her body that's all I did not make her hips or her legs or her boobs bigger or anything and then I did the dodging dodge and burn I think there's retouching on this. You can see that I did do what we classically call the dodge and burn thing uh, on the skin. Okay, and then some drama color. Uh, you know, basically, it's like as far as the um, you know Photoshop and being against Photoshop, and that's what I think. Mainly, this room is probably pretty Photoshop friendly, I would think. But um, you know, you don't want the movies to stop doing using special effects, do you? I mean, seriously? Mm. And I, that's the same way I feel about advertising. I, I want to be able to use special effects to, to advertise something. And I think the general population, you guys know Robert Downer, Downey Jr. doesn't have that body, don't you? 
I mean, sir, is that giving you a bad body image when you see Robert Downey Jr. like that? <laughs> it's, we all know it's special effects and it's, you know, it's been enhanced. So it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that. Um, so let's just open up a beauty image. So this, this is like kind of your typical thing that you're going to, a typical Im beauty image that you might work on. And I thought it would be interesting to see this particular image was, um, I have a Facebook group where I comment on people who are trying to, you know, work and become better at their craft and so on. And it's, you, people can get a lot of critique and stuff on there. So one person was working on this and people started commenting and I was like, I just can't explain to you what exactly it is that you're not doing quite right here. So being manic the way I am, I decided to stop what I was doing, took the file, it was a raw file, by the way, if you guys are looking for, I don't know if I said that already, on Model Mayhem, there's a, a, a website called Model Mayhem, you probably already heard of it, where a lot of photographers will put raw images on, on for you to pick up and practice on. You can't use them commercially, but you can use them for your portfolio. Sometimes they'll put the whole shoot and you can pick the raw file that you want and you can retouch it to your heart's content which I think is a really great resource because uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes to find good work to build a portfolio with. So this person uh, posted this and I took it and decided to um, retouch it to show them what I was talking about. So I'll just kind of run through the, the layer stack to show you like what is a typical retouch and what I would do to it. To say, I would say that I, I, this is not like really a finished finished, but it's a first round. Okay, so I'll show you the before and after before I go through the. So. Okay. And then. Oops. Okay, so I'll just. Okay. I'll just start off with the, okay, the raw file. This was when I pulled it into photo, Photoshop Raw uh, and I processed it because I already take a look at that. Um, that's, that was as it was shot. Okay, there's already some color issues that I can just address right away before I even get started. I could do it later in Photoshop, but why? I can go ahead and I know that I need to do these things. She's too, uh, she's too red, she's too saturated, several different things. So um, that was my conversion, okay? I decided to go, she looks, she feels a little bit kind of bluish to my eye on, I don't know what you guys can see up here, probably can't really tell, but um, I wanted to uh, get kind of a light, uh, creamy skin tone. So, okay, I started there and then I did my, um, this actually has a little bit of a contrast move on it, but it, it really shouldn't have anything merged into the pixels, but it does so. And so that's just a little bit of retouching. You'll see I did a little tiny bit of probably cloning and maybe even a little bit of healing. I don't like to use a healing brush too much because it's offensive. <laughs> and then, so there's a couple little things that I did here, like here's the lashes. I don't know if that's Drew lashes. It's a little pixelated up there. I don't know if you can really tell. They were not too bad lashes. Okay. So I drew lashes, but I, I used the help of a, of a brush that I set to have a little bit of a textured feeling to it rather than just using any brush. It was like, uh, if you open up Photoshop for the first time and you were gonna start using the paintbrush, if it was a four leaf clover brush, would you just leave it like that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> a lot of people would. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, probably not. You know, so the thing is you should really, you know, if you're photoshopping, you should learn how to use your brush tool, uh, your brush settings. So you know what kind of a, a brush you're using in the first place. Okay, softer brushes, harder brushes, et cetera, et cetera. So I used a brush that I set up so that it would be conducive to drawing little tiny white eyelashes. 
okay? So then it was easier for me and quicker, and I wasn't struggling against my brush. Uh, okay, uh, then the, the lips, I don't know if you can see that, I just added a little tiny bit of shine to the lips, so if I show you the mask, that's just a, a curve where I lightened everything and then I painted through the mask so that I could just enhance the shine on her lips a little bit. And then the rest of this, let's just turn it all on at once. This is the dodge and burn. Let's get up on her face a little bit more. Okay, so if I turn that, it's all in a group. Is it? Or No, it's not, but... Okay, so that is just dodging and burning, right? There's no cloning, there's no pixel moving, there's no, I'm, I'm not, it's, it's all non-destructive. All I did was use a, a curve to darken certain areas and another curve to lighten certain areas, and I just did it repeatedly until I got what I wanted. So that's from that, that's the finished, and that's before, okay? I am not touching a single pixel. I'm going to, oh yeah, I'm going to. She wants me to show you the mask, which I was going to do. Okay, so, uh, the, okay. So I'll just, that, that's the darkened mask. That's the first lightened mask. That's another lightened mask. That's another one. And that was it. That's all I needed. Okay, the lighten one, I can just do as many as I need. And this one, I kept it nice and concise because I knew I was gonna show students. So I kept them all in a nice little, I mean, there's no reason not to do that except that some, if I'm working for myself, I can be a little more sloppy because I, I know how I do it already. You know, I don't have to show myself later. <laughs> okay, so, and then I like enhance the gold a little bit. Okay, and, and also what is interesting is the, the color correction. Okay, so this is without any color. So I've now done my retouching, right? I've done, um, basically I've done all my skin retouching. I did my little, uh, you know, lips and I did my little eyelashes and stuff. Now I needed to do overall color, all right? So I'll just turn the color on and that's the color, okay? Before, after, let me show you the whole because, yeah, okay. Because her, her whole chest and everything like, that's before and after. Okay, so now if you look at the before, what, what really pops out at you? The hand, right? So the whole, your whole focus is at the bottom of the image and the hand. But afterwards, the focus is on the face, as it should be. So I'll just show you the... So the, f the first... Uh, the first color correction. So there's several color corrections in here, not a whole, whole lot. Um, there we go. So the first color correction that I did was a, uh, a hue saturation where I went into the reds. I moved to the reds, so I'm only affecting the, the reds in the image and I desaturated the reds just a little bit, 20 points. See, I desaturated just 20 points of the red. See how kind of reddish and burnt her face looks? And then, nice little correction, right? Just clean that right up, okay? And then the next thing that I did, this is something good to know too, I love this little curve. Uh, Photoshop gives you a bunch of custom curves. Most of them are totally useless, all right? Like the darken curve, uh, yeah, I guess we know how to do that. Like, cause it just darkens, all right? But the one curve that I do like is um, this linear contrast curve. The, and that, this is what it looks like right here. It's just a little teeny tiny bump. And so when they call an S curve, which is when you, you ha if your curve looks like that, you're adding contrast. And that's why they call it, you put an S curve on there to add contrast because you're, you're pushing the, the uh, you're pushing up the darks and lightening the lights. So it, it adds contrast to your image. But th and that's what this is doing, but ever so gently, right? It's, kind of, it's, almost, it's so gentle, it's almost hard to get the points to be right just like that if you pulled the curve yourself and like, unless you use the arrow keys. Uh, so, and, and, and the thing about it was when I looked at it, I thought, oh, okay. 
I like that, but if I turn the mask off, look at her neck when I turn the mask on and off. Uh, on, come on. Okay, on, off. So what happened was, I felt like that little curve was darkening her neck too much. So uh, all your adjustment layers come with a mask. So I just got a big soft brush, and of course you're gonna learn how to make one of those brushes in Photoshop to get the nice big soft edge brush, and then just brush away, gently away from those areas. It's not completely black, I didn't take it out completely, but I just brushed it away from a couple of places that I felt like it was over contrasting my image. The neck was getting a little too dark and contrasty right there, right? So look at those things, you know, as you're working. And then uh, uh, next was, and then uh, I darkened the whole thing down just a little bit. She was a little too on the bright side. And then this one is, I'm sure you're not gonna be able to see that. Her shoulder, just this part of her shoulder was just a couple of points too yellow. I mean, that's, my mother can't see a couple of points of yellow. Uh, most people I think can't see it, but I think she just doesn't want to see it. It's, it's difficult, it's difficult to see two points, two points of yellow. It's like, um, I don't know, if, can you see anything move? Yeah. See it? It's like, there it looks, so it feels a little dirty yellow, and then put it on, ah, cleaned it up, see that? And, and it, that's what retouching is all about, these tiny, small, minute. That's really, there's really a big difference to my eye and Tim's eye. Oh my God, we see this stuff. And we know other people out there in the world looking at, but that's what puts it all together in these ads to look so beautiful. I mean, are we faking the girl because we took, the camera's not a real thing anyway. Pictures of people are not real anyway, guys you've seen pictures of yourselves like, I don't look that good, that's for sure not right, you know? Or, like, hell, I never looked that bad in my life, it's the camera. <laughs> you know, the bad lighting or whatever it might be. So, you know, these, these kind of color correction things were bringing that photograph to its real life, you know, what it could really be. And so, so there was that and then then I darkened down her uh, shoulder just a little bit because it was reflecting a little bit too much light. And then of course, the hand. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the hand. Okay, then at the end I added a little grain layer just to give it a little bit more photographic uh, energy when it uh, prints. I don't always do that, but sometimes I do it and sometimes I do it a lot. I'll just show you a couple of, and I'm gonna leave some time for questions. I'll show you a couple of things that they ask us to do that's just ever so irritating. It's like, couldn't the hair guy okay, all right. have, I'm sorry, I'm getting a delay. Let's get rid of that. There we go. Okay, so this happens a lot, you know. They put the, <laughs> they put the, uh, but they put the wig on, and that thing is called a, a weff. They call it a weff. I learned this from retouching. I'm not a hair person, but these those those little pieces of hair that they they uh, stick in, like, um, you know, it's not just one, it's not like a wig. It's like pieces of hair that they kind of blend together, and it's like called a weff. So you can see the weff a lot of time around the. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to figure out a way to, and, and they wanted the roots, by the way. They wanted the dark roots. I was going to make it all blind. I think I made it all blonde, and they said, oh, can you put in dark roots? Yeah, sure. No problem at all. Okay, so, you know, got to figure out all kind of weird little tricks to make these sort of things happen. Yeah, and uh, example, photographer said, oh, Carrie, I shot this shot and the, the hairstylist wasn't very good. And, and, and the client wants it to look all like silky, silky. And can you make it look like that? No, no, 
I cannot. <laughs> uh, I'll have to have all new hair. I said, like, well, do you have any of that in your archives? Because I don't have any. <laughs> uh, for a fee, yes, for a fee. I have some hair like that in my... So I took um, a big, long shot of hair just hanging. Beautiful hair that I had used for another client. But it was for uh, the uh, hair, um, uh, hair dye. And so, like, you know, the top of the hair dye where they have like that little perfect piece of, uh, and then you can see what color it's supposed to be. That's us that do that, by the way, match the color. Uh, so I took the big long sheet of hair and I used it to replace every single piece of her hair. I made all the, I kind of tried to follow the way that it was laying. So every single piece of that hair is from a long sheet of hair that I just took and removed and warped and manipulated until I ended up with that. So you think you thought? <laughs> so we're used to seeing images like that. I mean, it looks, yeah, it looks natural for what you see in the, it looks like really retouched uh, hair. Looks like an ad. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, considering what I had to work with, I think it doesn't look that bad. Okay, we've got we have like about five minutes left. You guys want to? Um... So I noticed that um, a lot of times with retouching, um, grain is added to the photos. Grain. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Why? What? What does that do? I, I like the way it. I like that feel, but I'm not. I'm wondering about the. The, the reason behind it? Uh, because it, it actually, digi um, digital images have a tendency to have a digital look to them. And when you add grain, it gives it that more photographic look, like, you know, film grain, basically. So, and it also helps to hide, like, heavy retouching sometimes, too. So we don't really mind so much if we have to use it. I think he has to, you have to have the magic stick. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a junior retoucher who also has a degree in painting. And um, I love this. gloss? Oh, sorry? Do you, where at? Oh, at uh, Saks Fifth Avenue. Oh, oh okay. I thought, um, thought you said gloss. I love what I do a lot, and I kind of <laughs> want to pursue this very highly, but I'm nervous from what I've been hearing about this field often falling victim to global outsourcing. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I, I'm not in the slightest bit worried that somebody can outsource my job because uh, if um, making paths, for example, you know, cutting paths and that sort of stuff, yeah, outsource it. I outsource it. Uh, but I have never been able to outsource to anybody who was able to do skin properly. And even people in states, you know, like students and other, have a hard time learning how to dodge and burn. And we work like intimately with the, the client. Well, it, such fine-tuned stuff. It's going to be, if it ever happens, it's going to be so long in the future. I wouldn't worry about, like, when you're doing the high-end stuff, not a chance in hell. Tim, what do you think about that? I, I totally agree with you. Just uh, masking and stuff is great for it, but um, as far as skin retouching, you, you have to do it yourself. Never going to happen. Clients are never going to let that, for, yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Quit your job. <laughs> um, I listened to an interview actually with uh, that uh, Katrine had uh, of of Katrine's actually, and she uh, she she spoke about the importance about um, leaving imperfections and the artistry behind uh, retouching and using the imperfections to sort of lead you into the image. Um, if you could just more expand on it and how you feel about imperfection. I like to leave stuff. I, I mean, I, I let my clients push me to, you know, if they want me to take out stuff or they want, you know, like she's got a beauty mark. I love it. He wants it out. He's paying me. So, you know, I'm going to take that out. Uh, but I, I, it's a little push and pull. It's like I have like a, one client who 
has backed off of it because I just very gently move him in that direction. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of taste, you know, it's like, I, I like imperfections or lopsided looks on people. I didn't love the lopsided look on the hair girl I showed you because she was snarling, right? And I think she looked much better afterwards. But yeah, I like to leave stuff like that. I try to do it all the time, more and more. Uh, hi, thank you for being here, by the way. Um, Very welcome. Sometimes as photographers, when we take photos uh, and we see them displays, uh, displayed somewhere else, we're like, oh, I shot that. Do you sometimes feel robbed when the credit goes only to the photographer when you put so much work into it? Well, that's a hard question sometimes. You, you know, in the beginning, I did kind of feel like, because we never get any credit. And then there came a point where I thought, oh, I don't care, I get paid. You know, and that's really the important thing for me. But then it, 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 sometimes here and there, like on a big job um, where the nail girl got credit and I could, there was nothing left of what the nail girl did, nothing. <laughs> and I, you know, I just have to go, okay, whatever. But I did get paid for the job. All right, uh, when you're retouching and you start doing the lip size and other components, how do you um, keep the balance? Because, you know, a lot of times if you're doing something, you spend so much time on one detail, it throws the whole image off. So do you work back and forth, back and forth? Or yeah. Or you just... Yeah, I work back and forth. Back and forth. I mean, I take that in consideration before I even go into, like, I'm not, you know, I kind of have a plan before I get that far. You know, and I like to, one thing I like to do is uh, always go toggle back and forth to your original art to really understand what you're doing. Are you over retouching your girl? Sometimes, you know, I, I like, I'll look at my original art and I go, oh, 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 whoopsie daisy, you know, because I, I think it's, the, the select is a select for a reason. I always tell people that they didn't choose the crappiest image out of the shoot to give you to retouch. They chose you the one they liked the best, that had the best feel and this and that, and you, shouldn't change it unless, you know, if you're changing it that much, I think a lot of times it's because it was a bad shot and they're trying to salvage it, right? So, but it's a good point. It's a good point you make. So uh, you, you mentioned that you were going to give some tips on like how people get started or build up their portfolio. What do you recommend? Well, to go get the, go get good images first off. Um, and that's why I mentioned the, the model mayhem thing. Make friends with the photographers. If you're in school here, buddy up to the people who are shooting nice and you know, work for free and get a, get a good portfolio set up first. Make sure that you're working on good shots. And also when you, when you go to uh, like maybe get a job or go to a studio, don't take everything in your whole portfolio. Just take the very top notch pieces. People don't want to, they don't have time to look at it. They're looking at images all day long, millions, you know. When somebody comes to me, if the first two or three don't grab me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm already lost on that. I was like. I guess in the, I really don't mind if they don't show me, but I guess in retouching, I think it would probably be best to go ahead and show before afters, especially if it's um, like, it's like not, we're not talking like big, huge retouching or something that's very delicate to be able to, you know. Yeah, I think if you're going to go to a retouching house, you might as well. Um, what, is there an average turnaround time? Um, that clients give you, or is it? Does it all just depend on? Everything's you? always a rush. Trust <laughs> me, <laughs> right? It's always a rush. I'm like, oh, sorry about that. Uh, you know, I would have got them to you sooner. It's always the case, but you have to adjust them to your. You know, like there's a, an amount of time that you need to have to like really get a first round on, and it's it's totally going to depend because I do jobs that are, are like multi-image compositions. So, you know, I have to tell them, you know, whatever is a reasonable time period, but it, it doesn't, there's not really an average. That's, I usually I try to get a first round really in a couple of days on a simple shot. Oh, 
Okay, you guys um, scared now? I have one more <laughs> well, question that I'm yeah. curious about is, okay. I mean, to me, everything you do looks unbelievably uh, difficult and challenging, but from your point of view, looking back, what is one of the most difficult things uh, a client has asked you to do? One of the most difficult? Well, over the years, uh, a lot of different, we're talking about that girl? <laughs> okay, uh, I had to make a, uh, there was a, I had a girl uh, and I needed to place a hand into the, into the image and uh, the only hand they had was black girl's hand. So I had to make the black girl's hand a, a white hand to go with the girl in the image. Yeah, I, that's what I thought at first, but you know, yeah, it worked out, you know, you figure out your things. It, it looked real, it looked real. There was one that I did a while back, I wish I had the images, I really sh shouldn't show that around, but they, they, they had a girl who was, you've seen this one before, she's standing in the rain, yeah. and the request was to remove all the rain. It, it was all sprinkling all over her entire face, her hair. You could see it inside of her mouth against her teeth. And I took all the hair off, or the hair, the uh, rain. And that was hard. I'm impressed. Is it time for the, the question and the giveaway? Okay, well, yeah, the question. I, I was going to, okay, I, I have a super, super hard question. Let's see if anybody gets it. If, we, if nobody gets it, I'll, I'll ask an easier one. And the, the first one who gets the easier one, the first one who shoots their hands up on the easier question gets my book. Uh, okay, the first one's really hard, <laughs> but okay. There's, there's two filters uh, in Photoshop. One's called maximum and one's called minimum. Okay, you guys know it? Okay. The lowest, the very lowest that you can, uh, the lowest radius in maximum and minimum is one. Okay, so how can you trick Photoshop into going lower? Upsize the image, do a maximum, and then downsize it. No. Nope. Nice try, though. Nice try. Some of you are going to, some of you are going to, when I tell you, you're going to go, oh. Did you say get rid of the opacity? No. Nope. Make it, I'll give you a hint. Um, what in Photoshop allows you to lessen the effect of something. Who said it? Somebody said it first. You got a book. Fade. Fade. Somebody got it. Fade. You, you got a second. He, got, he said it one split second before you did. There you go. You're welcome. Good night, everybody.